chapter number 5. We're going to read about eight verses of scripture here this morning, uh, beginning in verse number 21. It is good to see everybody this morning, everybody in the house of the Lord, and uh, good to see anyone that is here for your first time. We thank you for coming, and uh, we pray that you will enjoy our service this morning. Most of all, that you will receive something from that's what this is about. Uh, yes, I want to grow, and yes, I want to see numbers, because numbers represent souls. But first of all, I want to move with God. I want to feel the Spirit of God. And, uh, because if God's not in it, we're just doing it on our own. We're not going to see real change in the lives of people. God is what, Jesus is what it takes to change people's lives. Amen? Uh, you, can, you can try AA. You can N.A., you can try uh, whatever, recovery centers, and, and I don't disgrade those things uh, totally this morning. I appreciate them and appreciate their efforts and works, and there have been uh, many people that have been changed through those programs, but I'm going to tell you, only Jesus can ultimately change your life. Amen. Only Jesus can ultimately change your life. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous teaches that once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. I believe that when God heals you, you're no longer what you were. Amen? If God heals you of a cancer inside of your body, you no longer have that cancer in your body, do you? You're a cancer survivor. Uh, so so if, if you are an ex-alcoholic and God has brought deliverance to your life, don't listen to that kind of teaching that once you're an alcoholic or once you're a drug addict, that you're always that. Amen? I don't believe that theory at all. I believe that when Jesus comes into your life and sets you and makes you free, that you are free indeed. Amen. Mark chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, and he saw him, and he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood for twelve years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came into the press behind and touched or when she had heard of Jesus she came in to press behind and touched his garment. And for she said, If I might touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Let us pray. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, as we enter into your word this morning, I ask God that we will take your word reverently, that we will respect your word, that we will respect your authority, that we will respect what you have given us upon these pages today. And that we will understand, God, that there is power in your word, in the spoken word, in the written word. There is power that cometh from your word. Let us receive what you have for us this morning. We ask and pray in your name. Can we all say amen? In our story this morning, there are two separate incidences in these verses that can actually stand alone. First of all, there is Jairus, whose daughter is about to die. And then there's the woman of the issue of blood that have been uh, suffering from this issue of blood for 12 years. And so we have two encounters that are ordinary, ordinarily combined into a teaching or into a preaching effort where we preach on the miracles of these two incidences. But my focus this morning will be upon the initial contact that Jesus briefly had 
as he touched upon the interruption encountered along the way. I am feeling that we need to give some attention to the importance of the interruption as we walk through our spiritual walks of life. How many of this, you this morning, as you're walking with Jesus and as you're walking with God and you're, you're doing what God has wanted you to do and you're doing what God has called you to do, there comes interruptions in your life. Maybe tragedies, maybe uh, obstacles, maybe situations or circumstances that, that come into your life and, and you're doing what God has called you to do and you feel like that you're serving God with everything that you have and then all of a sudden come these little interruptions in your life. Well, in our text this morning, we are quickly introduced to a man by the name of Jarius. Now, Jarius was a religious leader, and, and I preached upon these uh, verses back in May on Mother's Day. I used these same verses, but I want to talk from a different standpoint this morning. I want to ask you this morning, do you trust Jesus enough to walk with him. Do you trust Jesus enough to walk with him? Now, Jarius was a religious leader who had many religious responsibilities among his people. Jarius was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a, a holy man. He was one that believed in God. He believed in the power of God, and he, he believed in the presence of God. This was a man that was acquainted with problems such as his own. He had problems in his life. And that's where we will find this well-respected religious leader that he now was faced with a real tragedy in his life. And, and this real tragedy had taken up residence in his own home. How many of you know that it is, it is much different when you pray for tragedies for somebody else and when you, you pray for situations for somebody else or, or maybe another family has received a tragedy and we, we pray for that tragedy and we, we try to uh, be sympathetic toward them but we really cannot be sympathetic toward them because we have never been in the position that they are in and so the very most that we can do is try to empathize with them and be empathetic because sympathy means that you have been through the situation and you you know what it's like to deal with it but when you're empathetic it means that you have not been through the situation but you try to put yourself into the situation you try to understand what it is that somebody is going through and so this morning Jarius was put into a real situation in his own home and the Bible calls our attention to his daughter and his his daughter is laying there upon a sick bed the primary care physician the doctors had already made their diagnosis and they had already sent this little child home and and they had done everything that they knew to do there were no more medicines there were there was nothing that science could do for this little girl she had been sent home and she was on her deathbed and she was just about to die the doctors had finally said it's no there's no use in trying anymore she's dying there is nothing else that we can do Maybe you this morning have been in situations in your life where a doctor has told you that there's nothing else that we can do for you in your life. Or, or maybe it's a child that you've been told that there's nothing else that we can do for your child. The, the cancer has, has enlarged itself and it has spread into the body and, and there's nothing that we can do for you. There's nothing that, that we can do for your child. There's nothing that we can do for your situation. Any parent that has ever had a sick child knows what the emotional toll that it plays upon your life. And Jarius may have questioned God. He might have even blamed God for his misfortune. He had a, he, I'm sure that he had a feeling of, of mixed emotions with self-pity. And he, he probably said, God, I, I, I've served you. And God, I'm living for you. And, and God, I know your power. And God, I know your presence. And, and Lord, why does this have to happen in my life? God, I would rather you take my life than to take my little girl. And I'm sure that every one of us in this building this morning that have children can understand that statement when we would, we would rather give up our own lives than to see our children have to give up theirs. 
I know that if my children were suffering from a need, I would rather the Lord take my life than to take the life of my children. And I'm sure that Jarius had many emotions in his life. I'm, I'm sure that he was just like us. You know, sometimes when we read about men and women in the Bible, we think that they were some kind of superhuman hero, that, that they weren't like us, that there was something uh, extraordinary about them. They are men and women just like we are, and they walk through things just like we walk through, and they went through tragedies just like we go through in life. I can only imagine the mixed emotions that he must have been wrestling with, wanting to scream and holler, but nobody to scream and holler at. A feeling of helplessness and a great desire to do something, but yet not knowing what to do. Even beginning to think, God, I have been serving you, and, and now I have to deal with this. In the anguish of this religious leader, he now remembers this young rabbi that he has heard so much about. And the rabbi has been turning the Pharisees and the scribes' viewpoint on religion upside down. He remembers hearing about this young rabbi that was teaching in the local synagogues and, and how this rabbi was drawing huge crowds and, and they were seeing people saved and, and they were seeing people delivered and they were, they were seeing miracle after miracle that this this rabbi was preaching about to the crowds. As a matter of fact, the whole city had just attended one of his teaching sessions, and he remembers having heard of this man that had the power to heal. He had healed a man with a withered hand, and of course there was a tale about an insane man that lived among the tombs, and they said that this rabbi guy by the name of Jesus had healed him, and he had already taken a man with a withered hand upon his arm and, and he had healed him of his infirmity. And, and then there, there was this one lunatic that was uh, lying there between the tombs and, and Jesus had come to his point of contact and he had placed healing into his mind. He also heard the story about a wedding where the rabbi turned water into wine. Whether he And, and so whether this prophet was a true prophet or whether he was a fraud, Jarius did not know. All he knew is that this man had the power to heal the sick and he had to get to where he was. You see, I'm not sure how Jarius knew how to find Jesus on this particular day. But in the midst of his need, he said, I've got to get to where Jesus is. And there are some people in this building this morning that you are in situations in your life whether it be mental, whether it be emotional, whether it be physical, spiritual, financial, whatever it is in your life, whether it be relationships, whether it be sins that you're dealing with today, there are those of you in this building this morning that you need to get to where Jesus is. You need to find the place in Jesus this morning because you've tried it on your own long enough and it's been messed up long enough and it's not working anymore and it's not working on your own. You need to find Jesus today. Give Him praise in this house. And I'm not sure how Jarius knew how to find Jesus on this particular day, but in the midst of his need, he said, I've got to find Him. Great crowds were already there, and the text says that much people had gathered around unto him. Now, it is obvious that Jesus is at the height of his popularity. Jesus was still out there on the banks of the sea, and, and word had begun to spread around quickly that Jesus had returned. And perhaps many had been there waiting by the banks of the sea, waiting for the return of the Son of God. And text makes it appear that as though Jairus came upon Jesus suddenly and stumbled across Jesus suddenly, he had no time to think about what he was going to say or how he was going to put it into words. He just simply fell at the feet of Jesus and he began to plead the blood of Jesus over the situation that he needed in his life. I'm going to tell you something to, to put that into point this morning. You are here this morning and you say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to go about it. You just simply fall at the feet of Jesus and Jesus will begin to see your faith and his faith will begin to make you whole in your life. 
He fell at the feet of Jesus, Jairus, this great ruler, this great man of, uh, of stature, and he said, my little girl is sick. He said, Jesus, she's about to die. Can you come to my house? Can you come to my home? Can you go with me to where she is? He said, can you lay your hands upon her? And I, I know that if you will just touch her, that she will be made whole and that she can be healed. He said, Jesus, the, the doctors have given up on her. He says, Jesus, they've given her no hope. She is laying there on her bed and she's just about to die. I'm sure that this father had probably rehearsed in his mind what he was going to say because he was a man of great stature. He, he was probably well poised and he probably had things that he was going to say and he was probably going to politely ask Jesus if he would come to his house. But how many of you know that when you're going through situations in life, it's not always time to be polite. It's, it's, not, it's not always time to be dignified and, and to be full of pride and, and to allow pride to infiltrate your mind and to be so proudful that you cannot ask God to do something in your life. And so Jerry has shown up to the man Jesus and he, be, he moves beyond the politeness and he falls upon his knees before Jesus and he says, Jesus, my daughter is about to die and I need you to come to my house and lay your hands upon her so that she can be delivered. You see, our dignity goes out the window when we come face to face with Jesus. There is no way to be dignified with tears streaming down your face when you're falling down upon your knees before God and you're asking for help. You don't really care what everybody else says. You don't really care what everybody else thinks. You don't really care what everybody else is looking at and thinking what a fool they are and, and who do they think they are and what do they think they are. Can I say to us this morning that we are blood child of God we can do what God has called us to do and we can fall down at his feet and we can say Jesus I need you to come to my place of need you see there is no way to be dignified with tears streaming down your face when you fall upon your knees before God begging God for help you see I understand on Sunday morning when you see somebody get a little excited and, and other people looking at them wondering what's wrong with them, wonder what's, wonder what's wrong with them. You know something? We need a little bit of that excitement in our lives. We need a dance in our step and, and we need some joy in our hearts. And You know, some people look at Christians and they think, why would I want what they have? They look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. Why would I want that? I have more joy than they have. I live in the world and I'm more joyful than they are. Ladies and gentlemen, I can understand when somebody has a shout in their step and a dance in their heel. I understand when you begin to praise God and, and you don't really care what everybody else thinks. You don't really care if there's makeup running down your face. You don't really care if you're a big man to fall down upon your knees before God. You don't really care about those things. When I see those trying to praise God in a dignified manner, I don't criticize. They just have not met Jesus face to face in the midst of their storm. Can I say to you this morning, just keep on living and you will finally get there. Keep on living and there will be something that will happen in your life that will cause you to fall upon your face before Jesus. When you begin to ask Jesus for help and he delivers you, you can't help but get a little bit ugly for the Lord because God showed up and he paid a bill that you did not know how was going to get paid. He showed up just in time. He showed up when your child need deliverance. He showed up just in time. There was sickness in your body and the doctor said that there is nothing that we can do. Can I say to you this morning that his 
grace is sufficient to handle every problem that you are going through in life. You will be just like Jesus or just like Jairus when you fall down on your knees and you begin to worship God. You see, it is the man's faith that compelled Jesus to follow him. Now listen, Jesus was following this man. Listen to that. Jesus was following Jairus. Now, would we have ever thought of Jesus following anybody? I mean, Jesus was the leader, right? We're supposed to follow Jesus. But the Bible said that the faith of Jairus caused Jesus to follow after Jairus. Now, listen to me this morning. I want to go somewhere with this. If this man's faith that compelled Jesus to follow, notice that as soon as Jairus spoke his faith, Jesus was attracted by that faith and went with him to heal his daughter. Now here's the interesting thing about this text. This text does not record that Jesus even spoke a word to this father that was in need. This man fell down at the feet of Jesus, and without a word from the mouth of Jesus, Jesus just simply followed Jairus because of his faith. Look at the text again with me. In verse number 24, it says, And Jesus went with him. Can everybody say, And Jesus went with him. You see, most of us, did not even catch the significance of these initial words that begin this verse. Initially, our faith, when we are first saved, is mirrored by this verse, in this verse. Jairus must have been feeling good at this point because in the midst of this dramatic text, Jesus was interrupted. Now here's what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes this morning. As he and Jairus and the disciples were making their way through the multitude, the Bible said that a woman came up to Jesus that had had an issue of blood for 12 years. And she comes up from behind him and she secretly touched the hem of his garment. Now this was also a touch of faith. And Jesus turns and he asks, who touched me? He said, who was it that touched me? And his disciples said to him, they said, Lord, how could we know who touched you? You see all the thousands of people in this crowd? There is no way that we could know who it was that came out of the crowd and touched your garment. But Jesus said this. He said, this touch is different because I felt the virtue of come out of me. Someone paraphrased it by saying this, someone has made a demand upon my ability. Someone has made the demand upon my ability. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of this father. This father has desperately made his way through the crowds to Jesus to beg him to come and to heal his daughter because his daughter is lying on her deathbed. And obviously he wants Jesus to hurry up and to get to his house because she only has a matter of days and she's going to die. She's dying. She's laying there on her deathbed. And so Jairus is wanting Jesus to hurry up and get there as quickly as he possibly can because there is no time to lose. She could die at any moment. In fact, she could already be dead by the time he returns. You know, there weren't cell phones back then. There weren't telegrams back then. There weren't methods of letting anybody know. And so in the time that he had gone to find Jesus, for all he knows is that his daughter might already be dead. And so Jairus is wanting Jesus to hurry up and come as quickly as he possibly can because she could die at any moment. 
And then on the way, some woman sneaks up behind Jesus and by an act of faith demands upon his ability. As Jesus stops to minister to her, Jairus is left standing there to watch this scene and think within himself, this isn't fair. He's probably standing there thinking, this isn't fair. This woman is of age. She has been sick for 12 years. But my daughter is laying upon her deathbed. This lady's been sick for 12 years. Yes, she needs to be healed, but she's not going to die in the next few hours. And so I'm sure Jarius began to think, my daughter is back home about to die. I came to Jesus first, and he should come with me to heal my daughter. And then he can attend to this woman. That's the way we think, isn't it? That's our natural way of thinking. And this was a natural man. Besides, Jairus probably thought, since she's unclean, she does not even have the right to be here anyway. Because at that time, the Levitical law stated that if a woman had an issue of blood, she was ceremonially unclean by law. And so therefore, she was not even allowed to be in public. And so this lady could have been arrested and put into jail simply because she was in public with her infirmity, with her issue of blood. And Jairus was probably thinking, Jesus, what are you thinking? You see, I don't know about you, but I had to learn to appreciate and thank God for the interruptions that he sends into my life. Because just when it things, seems, things, things seem like that they are going well, all of a sudden, here comes an interruption. Does anybody have those things happen in their lives? Things are going well, and then all of a sudden comes an interruption. Just when you are preparing for that promotion, here comes an interruption. Just when your health seems to be improving, all of a sudden, here comes an interruption. Just when your relationships were going well, all of a sudden, here comes an interruption. You see, the interruptions that I encounter in my life help me to refocus my attention upon God and take my sights off of myself and focus upon the sufficiency of God. Interruptions are not sent to harm us, but they are sent to help us. I'm trying to welcome interruptions in my life as a potential gift of God because after all God has a much better plan for my day than do I God knows everything about my life I think that I know what I need today I think that I know what I need God to do in my life today but you know something God knows far better than do I He knows what I need so this interruption in the life of Jairus would be used to elevate his faith to another level. You see, some of us don't allow interruptions to take us to another level. When we get into interruptions, we fall down into the pity party and we fall down into the, the mires and we roll around into the mires and we never allow God to really develop our faith. It's during the interruptions that God wants to develop our faith and take our faith to another level. And so this woman that interrupted the previous schedule had been suffering for 12 long years. She had spent all of her money on physicians, and the Bible said that she grew worse. And here Jesus was taking up precious time with his social outcast when it seemed that he should be dealing with the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue. Now this narrative is evidence that Jesus is not a respecter of persons. Listen to me this morning. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. Here in this story, we have two different people from two different, or the same society, but from two different measures of society. We have Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a man of great stature. He was a man that everybody respected. He was a man of influence. He was a man of honor. 
And on the flip side of that, we have a woman that had an issue of blood that was not even supposed to be in public. This narrative is evidence that Jesus is not a respecter of persons and he will minister to the highest ranking official and he will also minister to the lowest outcast of society. He had started going along with Jairus in response to his faith and on the way he stopped and ministered to this poor woman in response to her faith. This demonstrates the fact that the Lord is not looking for those who have wealth, position, nor power. All He is looking for is somebody that is filled with faith. That's good preaching this morning. He's looking for somebody that is filled with faith. He's not concerned about your richness. He's not concerned about your wealth. He's not concerned about your position. He's not concerned about how many degrees you have. He's not concerned about your power. He is not concerned about any of those things. He is concerned this morning about your faith. So this woman was healed because of her faith, the Bible said. Can you only imagine how Jerry's spirit must have been lifted? As he face to face watched the miracle for himself because when he watched this miracle for himself he knew that he was on the home on the way to his house to heal his daughter and now he had seen this woman physically healed and he knew that if Jesus could heal this woman and he saw it happen with his own eyes then surely he could heal his daughter but how many of you know that Satan will not allow us to enjoy good news very long because there is a message that is coming that's going to burst Jarius' bubble that will really rock his world. Doesn't that sound just like the enemy? God does something great, spectacular in our lives and we're happy and everything is go lucky and it seems like everything's just working for the betterment. And then all of a sudden, Life throws us a curveball, and out of nowhere, the enemy begins to attack our lives. Satan will not allow you to enjoy the good news very long. As Jesus is talking with a woman, messengers from Jairus' house come to tell him. They come to Jairus. Now, this is before they've made it back to the house, and they say, Jairus, your daughter has died. Jairus, there's no need in getting Jesus to come. There's no need because your daughter has already died. And Jesus hears what the messengers have relayed to him, and immediately he turns now shocked as a father would be, and he says to him, Be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid only believe. In other words, what Jesus was saying is he is saying, son, daughter, don't panic. Don't panic. He says, be not afraid, only believe. He was telling this man to act just as he had been acting before he received this bad report. Now, wait a minute. We need to understand something here. I've just been given the message that my daughter has died. How am I going to receive the bad report and just go on before I did before it was received? A bad report is given, and the Bible said as soon as Jesus heard it, that he addressed Jairus, and he said, Be not afraid, only believe. I shared with that to share with you this. This is where all too often you and I fell as believers. The word went right to Jairus as soon as the bad news arrived. When we receive bad news, we spend too much time doing everything else before going to the Word of God. We spend time in every other method but we don't go to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about my situation? 
we fall out, we cry, we complain, we get on the telephone saying, why me? And then we are at our breaking point, and when we get to our breaking point, then we go to Jesus, and Jesus immediately addressed and comforted Jairus. You see, as far as Jesus was concerned, death was no greater a challenge than sickness. He knew that if he had power to restore health, he also had power to restore life. That's why he told Jairus not to panic. So I stopped to ask you this morning, do you trust Jesus enough to walk with him? Come on, what would Jairus, what was Jairus to do? What do we do when our situation goes from bad to worse? What do we do when our marriage goes from bad to worse? What do we do when our job goes from bad to worse? What do we do when our children grow from bad to worse? What do we do when our finances are going from bad to worse? What do we do when the charges go bad? Jesus might ask you today, trust me enough to walk with me. Do we allow the Word of God to immediately penetrate our heart when things go from bad to worse? I can hear Jesus saying this morning, Jarius, I heard the same report as you, but do you trust me enough to walk with me? Obviously, as I'm about to close this morning, Jarius' mental and emotional attitude had a great job to do with what was going to happen next. And the same thing is true with us when the Lord tells us not to be afraid and not to panic. He is not saying that the situations will never be negative. He is not saying that you don't have to face the realities of life because they are very real. Just as the situation that Jairus' daughter, that was a real situation, and his daughter was now dead, and that is about as bad as it gets. I can't think of anything in my life worse than if my son or my daughter were lying on their deathbed. And somebody comes to me and says, your daughter is dead. I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would say. I don't know how I would feel because I have never been there. Some of you have been in that situation this morning. As I look across this audience, there are those that have lost little children. There are those that have lost adult children. And you know what it's like to see your son or your daughter on their deathbed. Jesus did not deny that the reality of the situation. He did not deny that at all. But he did indicate by his words and his actions that it was not the ultimate or the final reality. The first thing that Jairus had to understand was that the, 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 that, that was the fact that Jesus does not do funerals. Jesus was ready to continue walking to the home of the religious leader, and now I am sure this grieving father and Jesus is not in the funeral business. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? He was traveling in the city of Nain when he ran into a funeral procession, and a mother, she was a widow, already had lost her husband, and now she was burying her son. And Jesus stopped the funeral processional, and he touched the boy on the hand, and the boy began to rise up. You remember the story of Lazarus. Lazarus had been dead for four days. We're not talking about four minutes or four hours. Four days, Lazarus had been dead. I'm sure his body was already beginning to stink. No doubt. Because after four days, if something is not done with a body, it will begin to stink and it will begin to decay and, and things will begin to happen to the body. And he had been lying there for four days. Mary and Martha said, Jesus, if you would have just come, now it's too late. And, 
and Jesus shows up to the house of Lazarus and while the family was mourning he approached the tomb and said to Lazarus he said Lazarus come forth so in our story this morning as I began to close he went right on toward Jerry's house just as he had been doing before the bad report came and he started out with Jerry's in response to his faith Remember, as we started in the beginning, Jesus was following Jairus at the mention of his faith, at the belief of his faith. He did not intend to stop now just because of the physical circumstances that had changed. Jesus did not tell this man, too bad, Jairus, if this woman hadn't stopped me and, and we hadn't healed her, then I would have had time to have gone to heal your daughter. It must not have been the will of God that your daughter be healed because if it had been his will, she would have, she would have lasted until I arrived on the scene. I'm real sorry, Jarius, but it's too late for me to do anything about it now, so I may as well be on my way. No, that's not what Jesus said, and that's not what Jesus did. He went right on toward Jairus' house just as if nothing had happened. What Jesus is saying to us this morning is, do you trust me enough to walk with me? Verse 24 again, it said, and Jesus went with him. Things are not looking good for this father. News just arrived that, have rocked, that has rocked Jairus' world upside down. And after news had come, Jesus suffered no man to follow him. Did you catch it? Jairus was initially in charge. Follow me to my home, Jairus said. And Jesus followed him because of his faith. Jairus was in charge. But now everybody is required to follow Jesus. No one now following but the inner circle and Jairus and our faith does not escalate until we begin to follow Jesus. Jesus went with him and now they must all follow Jesus. Jairus was in charge initially, but now Jesus is in charge. And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Do you trust me enough? to walk with me? Do you trust me enough to keep on walking with me? I heard the news. I heard the report. But do you trust me enough to walk with me? I'm going to keep on walking to your house, Jarius. Do you trust me enough to keep on walking with me? I'm going to walk in spite of your report, Jarius. Do you trust me enough to keep on walking with me? Do you trust me enough to walk with me? Jesus said, everybody else, go home. But Jarius, do you trust me enough to walk with me? As we return to the music this morning, here we see the end of this fast-paced narrative. Jesus walked into his house, took the little girl by the hand and said, Little girl, I say unto you, arise. And you know what had happened? The little girl rose. I want you to know this morning that if you just walk with Jesus in the times of adversity and in the times of the storms, and if you refuse to let go of your faith, Jesus can and Jesus will make a way where there seems to be no way. I've heard people say, I can't afford to give my tithing to the house of God. When you understand the concept of giving, you can't afford not to give your tithing to the house of God. You sit down on paper and you figure up your bills and you don't have enough money to even make the bill payment and so the first thing to go is your tithes. 
I'm going to tell you, if you'll pay your tithes to God, He'll take care of the rest. I don't know how it happens. I just know it does. I've done it too many times. There's often times where I don't have the money to pay tithes. I don't pay them because I have the money. I pay them because it's what God said to do. And for some way or somehow, God always takes care of our needs. Do you trust me enough to walk with me? Jesus is saying this morning, I can resurrect your marriage even though it appears to be dead. Your situation might look dead and hopeless this morning, but Jesus is saying, if you will walk with me, I will walk with you. Whatever your eyes see is not your ultimate reality. Do you trust me enough to walk with me? Because Jesus has another plan for you. And Jesus has another plan for your family if you will only walk with him. Don't throw in the towel. Don't throw it in the air and say, if this is what serving God is all about, I might as well live in the world. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't cop out. Just keep on pushing and keep on propelling and, and keep on moving forward. And as long as you're walking, you're making progress. You might not be moving a whole lot of time, but if you're moving forward, two steps forward, one step back, you're still making one step forward progress. Just keep on doing what God wants you to do. Don't throw in the towel. Don't lose your faith. Don't trust your eyes. Walk by faith. Don't listen to the opinion of others. You know something? If we listen to the opinion of others all the time, they will have us down to where they are. Critics say you can't do it. No, I can't do it, but by God's grace, God said I could. No, I don't have the money to do it, but you know something? My God owns the cattle up on a thousand hills. Everything out here belongs to Him. You came into this world naked, you're going to leave it naked. You're not going to take anything with you. Where is your faith? this morning as we stand in this building. I know I've been lengthy this morning. I've preached well longer than I usually preach, but I felt like that this was a well-needed word of God this morning.